which I'm going to be interviewing Jessica Kent. She's a, a former ex-felon herself, so this is going to be a real interesting interview. Before I get started, check out our membership programs on Patreon, YouTube, and please join the Action Crew, because this is the stuff we're going to try to help with. We're going to try to change lives. Now, let's get right to the interview, everybody. Let me introduce Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I know you rarely do this, so I'm very honored to be here. Yeah, you know, I like to interview people who are interesting stories, not only interesting stories that align with what I do, prison reform and, and helping people who are behind bars or have a story, and your story is amazing. Why don't you give a, a quick uh, little, little recap of what you're doing and where you came from and a little bit about yourself. Sure, so I can talk about myself forever, but I um, am from upstate New York. I grew up in a really poor area in upstate New York, and I was a really troubled kid. I was constantly getting in trouble, and from the age of 14 to 28, I was on some form of supervision, whether that was probation or parole. Um, and it started young. I, I'm a recovering drug addict, so for me, I partied. I partied really hard. And that, over time, led to a heroin addiction and then a meth addiction. So for almost a decade, I was a really, really bad active user. I was also a drug dealer, so there's a lot of twists and turns in my story. And at that point in my life, I thought, only the good die young. It's fine if you die at 25, as long as you live it up. You know, I had this very weird sense of, I'm gonna burn this down, <laughs> you know? Um, and I thought there was nothing wrong with that. I, I was a really arrogant, selfish, uh, violent kid. And, you know, I, I had a lot of growing up to do, which, um, it's funny, I ended up going to prison again, and this time, it's different. When you say again, you mean, you went twice, or? Yeah. I, I mean, besides getting many arrested, a lot of drug oh, uh, yeah, offenders usually are, I, we call it doing life on the installment program, you know, yes. going back and forth. So. Right. So I caught my first case. I was almost 17. It was criminal sales of controlled substance. A kid, over, a kid overdosed and almost died. Luckily, he did not die. And that should have been a wake-up call. You know, like, this is dangerous what you're doing. You're putting your own life at risk, other people's lives at risk. But it wasn't. You know, I, I was very mean to him. He ended up getting a restraining order on me because I threatened his life. Um, and I, I had no respect for anything. The law, other people, myself. And at 22, I got arrested in Arkansas, which I couldn't even point that out on a map when I went there. I was I was in prison in Arkansas, Forest City, Arkansas. Were you I was really? In prison there. Yeah. Different world down there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it sure is. So I get arrested for uh, delivery of meth and uh, simultaneous possession of drugs and a firearm and possession with intent. Now I'm going back, you know, and. I didn't go alone. I was actually pregnant when I got arrested and I had no idea that I was pregnant. So I remember this jail nurse telling me like, that's why you don't feel good, sweetheart. You pregnant, you can go back. And I'm like, uh, you got me confused with somebody else. <laughs> I'm not pregnant. I was in complete denial of that. But over time, you know, I didn't just gain a little bit of commissary weight. <laughs> I was definitely pregnant. Um, and that was a whole different ball game for me. I was, for the first time in my life, afraid, you know, afraid for my sentence, what I was going to go through, what my unborn child was going to have to go through. Um, and I was for nine months in danger, you know, because you never know what other people are going to do. And I had enemies, but I also had friends. So I was very fortunate that I had people that had my back during that time. But she was born while I was in prison. I ended up getting a five-year sentence and Arkansas makes you serve 50% of your time or third doesn't make sense. I can't Lucky. even. I mean, the, fe the feds are 85. 80, right. I was, I was very, I was very grateful for that. But at the time I was bitter, you know, because I have to, I have to raise this child. What do I do? You know, and growing up in New York, I knew of a program in Bedford Hills where you ca you can keep your baby. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case all across the country. You know, there are very few programs for mothers and babies. So when I had my daughter, um, I was chained to a bed. I had her for 24 hours, and then the doctor came in and said, I'm gonna give you another 24 hours. That was a gift. That was a precious gift, and I think the doctor kind of smiled at me when I'm like, I can't take Percocet, because they were offering me Percocet. I'm like, I just had a baby, I'm a drug addict. Give me ibuprofen and some really strong coffee. If y'all got espresso, I'm gonna need that espresso. You know, because I have to stay awake for 24 hours. I have to hold this baby and stare at her and, and enjoy the 24 hours that I have. So when they said, I'm gonna give you another 24 hours, 
I mean, I was so grateful and just, I wanted it to last forever. Um, she was the cutest little thing I'd ever seen. And it was that moment that I decided, you're done. You need to hang up your hat. You need to retire. No more selling drugs. No more doing drugs. No more running around the country acting like a fool. You're done. You have just retired. And how old are you at this time? I was 23 22? when she was born. So that's young, wow. you know. Um, so so a couple of questions, obviously, sure. in order. You, amazing story. First of all, uh, I want to congratulate you. I mean, a lot of people, I often talk about drug addiction. I've done every drug in the book. You name it, I've done it. Never become an addict. I have that personality that's not wow. addictive personality like that. Uh, I controlled it. I didn't, con I didn't let it control me. Obviously, you know, most addicts do. But I often talk about a, a life-changing event. And let me give you what I mean. Everybody's different. Uh, I teach about, uh, about this on the road when I do speaking engagements. Every person's different, meaning this. A, one person could be driving down the street and almost hit somebody while they're high, get home, be shaken, and say, I'll never do drugs again. They hit a bottom. Another person gets arrested, spends a night in jail, says, man, fuck this. I'm never doing drugs again. He hit a bottom. Then you get a person like Larry Lawton, who went to prison, was facing life. I ended up getting four 12-year sentences, but I ended up facing life. I still didn't hit my bottom until I was in the hole, and a friend of mine hung himself and killed himself and mm -hmm. told me he was going to do it. So I hit my bottom there. Everybody hits their bottom somewhere, Jessica. Obviously, you hit your bottom realizing, wow. This is my daughter. This is my daughter, my flesh and blood. And, and, and I know I have two children. Now I have two grandchildren. And my grandson is four or before, and my granddaughter just turned two. So it's like, you know, you live for those. And now, obviously, you're doing very well. Uh, I want to just say before I ask some more, of course, I'm proud of you. I think it's really, really uh, uh, admirable that everybody goes through ups and downs. Listen, I deal with people all over the world. And when you hear one person, I said, listen, everybody could have went to prison. Everybody makes mistakes. I don't care who you are. I was at a function and someone says, oh, you know, big crowd, about 300 people. Someone raises their hand and says, oh, I would never go to prison. I said, let me ask you a question. Have you ever drove 20 miles out over the speed limit? And they go, well, maybe passing someone. I said, if you hit somebody and killed them, that's vehicular homicide over 20 miles an hour, you're going to jail. You're going to be my celly. Now, are you a bad person? No. You made mistakes, you, you got caught up with drugs or whatever you did in our lives. And I don't ever, and I don't see you doing it, I don't ever make excuses for who I was. But I try to help people realize, listen, there's a better way. Now, I know this is a tough question I don't try, like to ask uh, to, to women. How old are you now? I'm 31. Wow. And everybody healthy? Everybody uh, in good shape? Are you, uh, are you in a relationship? Did, you, did the dad stay with the baby? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. He has struggled with addiction, and he also went to prison that same day, uh, and well, jail and then prison. Y'all know how it goes. But his addiction, his <laughs> Big addiction, difference, but... huge, massive. Um, yeah. Side note: County jail is a million times worse than prison, in my personal experience. <laughs> well, it depends um, on where you're at. True, prison. if you're I was Rikers. In maximum security prisons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. And maximum security. Me too. Go ahead. Um, but his addiction never stopped. Um, you can find drugs in prison, in every prison in America. So his addiction, unfortunately, he never got better. And he's now facing about five more felonies today. So he's still struggling. Um, but I found a man, y'all. <laughs> I, I found a really good man, and I've been with him for seven years. And that is my daughter's father. You know, he stepped up, and he's so good. He's so great. And we've been blessed with a second daughter. She is four. And that second kid gives zero Fs about anything. The second one will try you. <laughs> you can curse on this. On my channel, you can curse. So don't worry about that. It's oh, not cool, like cool. We're, we're, we're dropping F-bombs. But, it, you know, it, you understand. But I got to respect you for what you did coming out and now having two great children. And I often tell this. I said, people who went through adversity like you have, become a lot stronger and a lot better person, a lot better mom, and a lot better educator, because really I consider you an educator. When I looked you up, Jessica, my son had found you, I guess, or you found me, I didn't know mm -hmm. how it worked. And he says, lad, dad, he goes, you'd really like this girl. She's really changed her life, and, and she has a YouTube channel, and, and I think we could help her and you know tell her story and, make, and 
and do good and try to help other people who are making those choices. Somebody sitting home right now who's listening to this uh, podcast or a video like on yours or mine, and they change their life. You know, they say, I get a lot of emails of people said, Larry, you've helped me through depression or you've helped me. I haven't did a drug since talking to you. And, and it, it's very heartwarming. I get the assholes too, Jessica. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the people, who, you know, hey, you're, a, you're an ex-con, you fucking people should be in jail forever. I get those, but you know what? They got to live their own life. We have to forgive ourselves. So now let's get back to your little story here. Uh, you got a great story in the morning. I'm really happy for you and your husband, obviously, and the two children. I got great parents, I'm sure. What are you doing now? Obviously, you're doing YouTube. Are so, you working? Are you... Just to back up a little bit, you mentioned my strength, and the truth of it is, you don't know how strong you are until being strong is the only option you have. You know, um, yeah. it took a lot to get to where I am today, just mentally. Not the physical stuff outside, but mentally. You know, it took years in my sobriety to even get comfortable in my own skin. And I think when people are pulling themselves out of that, they get frustrated at times because it's like, I feel, I don't feel good. Mentally, I'm not, I'm not okay. So for me, I was using drugs for a long time. I didn't know how to handle my emotions. I didn't know that I have depression and anxiety because I self-medicated that from 13 to 23, you know, and, and that was that. tough. Yeah. Depression, PTSD. Um, yeah. 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 When my daughter was born in prison, that was the first time I realized like this, I'm something's wrong. I had extreme postpartum depression and PTSD from being ripped out of that hospital room. Uh, I spent a couple of weeks in the infirmary and I have like fleeting moments of the correctional officers trying to talk to me when I was coming back through intake. I don't really remember what they said. I don't remember hearing. We're going to get into said. that one second because okay. we're going to get into the whole prison experience here. In yeah. a minute. I'm just trying to get where you're at now. Oh. Do you have do you have urges? Do you have, uh, I mean, obviously addiction is a lifelong thing. And I, I was telling you, you know, before we did the interview here, I, I was off camera telling you about how I was lucky about not having that addictive personality yeah. per se. Do, do you find the urges? Do you ever like, you know, there's things rip at you and, you know, you have to fight it because, you know, now you got two lives that you're really responsible for that. It's just amazing to see. I mean, people out there and young people watch our podcasts are going to realize, wow, is it like, yeah, it, it's a feeling like you can't even explain, I tell people. Yeah, so, for me, I, I am triggered by certain things. What is weird about my triggers is one of them is cash. <laughs> so I don't like having cash <laughs> in my hand because I, I was a drug dealer. I had a lot of cash, you know, so I don't like cash, which is odd, but my depression is my biggest trigger. So I have to keep my mental health in check because if I don't, everything else falls apart. You know, so it's been eight years mm-hmm. now. My daughter's eight, I'm eight years sober. Um, it's easier. The first few years, it was so hard because life was just throwing me tons of obstacles and I had to respond to them in the correct way. That was the hardest for me. Now, I wouldn't say that I have urges, but I definitely get overwhelmed with stress and depression and anxiety. And that is typically where my brain is just like the drug addict mentality tries to creep in. And I have a good support system, which is what I would recommend to anyone that's struggling with addiction. I voice that I'm struggling. I let my boyfriend know like, y'all, you need to take the kids. I'm going crazy. I just need a minute to myself. I need to, you know, take care of my mental health, take care of my physical health, and then, you know, I can do better. And uh, obviously you're getting that support because you and I both know it's easy. You know, when I first got out, it would have been easy for me to dip back into crime. Oh yeah. Because I was a very successful criminal. I mean, made 15, 18 million. I mean, my, my whole life was a big, big success in the crime world. But you're always looking over your shoulder. I don't have to tell you about the drug business or the crime business because you were in it. You know, a lot of people ask me, they go, ah, you know, you are not into drugs, but what do drug people have relating with you? And I said, they were criminals. And, and, and they don't understand what I mean by that. They go, no, they were addicts. No, no. Trust me, if you're a drug, into drugs, you're a criminal because you're doing something to get that money, you're doing something to get the you know, su- support that habit because you just can't do it. I don't care how much money you have. If you're, you will go through it. I've seen people blow businesses, million dollar businesses yeah. because of drugs. Uh, did you go through any, like, uh, before we get into the prison part of it, when you had your kids, you got off it. Was there any help group, whether it's, uh, you know, AN, uh, you know, or, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, NA, or any of them that helped you or was it just your inner fortitude? So that decision was made in prison. Um, I knew that I I was done. I was going to quit no matter, like, by any and all means necessary. I don't attribute my sobriety to NA. Um, 
I was court mandated to go to NNA, NA, and I just kind of have that personality where if you're forcing me into something, I'm not going to be too happy about I'm it. I'm the same way. I'm not a big believer in those. I really am not. Not that they don't work for some people. And I always they, say they that. do. But I'm not a supporter in those, right? But I, Per se. Yeah. I think you got to do it. Personally, I had to make that change on my own. Um, and I felt a lot of shame surrounding those meetings and I didn't feel good going there. You know, I am not anonymous. I'm Jessica Kent and I got sober and I beat that, you know, but good for you. It, At the, when, when your baby was born, mm -hmm. was your baby born an addict? No. So thankfully I was only three weeks pregnant when I was arrested. So I was okay. barely okay. pregnant, five minutes pregnant. Um, she was born very, very healthy and she has no symptoms of any of that. Thank God. So right when you knew you were pregnant, you stop drugs. Right. Literally stop drugs. Right. Wow. I that shows the power of, of a baby or of a human life. You literally, yes, you were in jail, but in you, you and I both well know there's drugs in prison any way you want or jail, anything you want. I, Absolutely. I did my best drugs in prison. I did a lot of acid in prison. And, and obviously, you know, drugs are everywhere in prison and you didn't do it. So that says something. Now we're going to get a little bit, if you don't mind, into your incarceration and your actual having birth, because I know my audience is probably saying, wow, what is it like? What do they do? Once you, like you come into intake and they say, hey, listen, you're pregnant. What do they do? Do they just throw you still into population? Give us a little bit of uh, how that works. Yeah, so um, because of my charges, I was supposed to be in a max, um, but- And your charges were uh, deal, uh, dealing, what were your exact charges? Possession were with intent. Were they distribution? Yeah, possession with intent to distribute, delivery of meth, which is uh, controlled controlled buys, because people yeah, class, suck. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then simultaneous possession of drugs and a <laughs> I firearm. I love you already. <laughs> firearm, I try to even tell people, don't get away from a gun, that's just an enhancement that you don't want. Right, we were able Obviously. to get it null processed because you know it was nowhere right. near me when we were arrested. It's a whole story. I can get into that in, you know, later in the interview if, you, if you'd like, but yeah, I was supposed to be placed at a max. Well, when I went into intake, they, they do the medical stuff when you're going into prison. It's this whole long, drawn out day. And this is in what state? Arkansas. Illinois? Arkansas. Arkansas, okay. And you, now you weren't living there at the time, were you? I was living in Arkansas for about seven months. And at that point I was heavily okay. addicted. Okay, so you were, to the residence was there. Okay. Technically. And you were dealing out of, like you're dealing in your crimes or out of Arkansas? Everything out of Arkansas. I mean, Arkansas, where's Arkansas? It's a flyover state. <laughs> That's what we used to call well, it. Well, um, yeah, but, I, I ran from some felonies in New York that I was innocent of. And I'm like, I know I can fight this, but I can't fight it out of the county jail with a public defender. I have to fight it away from here. Um, so I ran, I knew a friend in Arkansas. Again, I couldn't even pick it out on a map. I had no freaking idea where it was. I'm like, Arkansas, what the hell is that? <laughs> Um, so I get there and I meet a bunch of people that were selling and using meth and I'm like, oh, pff, I'm a hustler. I can do this. It was all coming from Mexico. It was strong. It was addictive. And at that point I lost all control of my addiction. I became very, very sick. I wasn't eating. I wasn't drinking water. I was covered in tracks and I weighed 90 pounds when I was arrested. I looked and mm. was disgusting. I mean, I was so sick. Yeah. So fast forward, I take my plea at six months, six months pregnant, little six months and change. Um, now you know you're pregnant, right when they told you in intake, you said they told you in intake you were pregnant? They told me in the county jail that I was pregnant and I was in complete denial. And, and did you just happen to get a test? I mean, nobody just gets a pregnancy test. Did you feel right, not have a period? I understand all right. that. Right. So. <laughs> um, so a friend of oh, mine man. put in a oh, kite. Man. A friend of mine put in a kite for me to go to medical because I was sick. I didn't even request to go. And I remember one day they called me out and they were doing a bunch of stuff, but I'm detoxing. I'm in and out of it. All I want to do is sleep, you know? Um, so the, the only thing I remember is I'm calling me out and then the nurse telling me I was pregnant because I'm just not even in my right mind. You right, know? Sure. I, I remember even standing in the hallway like, what the fuck are we doing today? You know, I had no clue what was going on. Um, so six months later, I, I take my plea. It was the third plea. I really had to fight the state of Arkansas to get the plea that I got. They offered me 20. I told them to go fuck themselves. They offered me 10. I said, absolutely not. And I thought, I'm going to trial. 
I'm going to trial in a state where they won't give me legal material. I have no access to the law library, no books whatsoever. And that's as a, so against the law. You know, I did the law for 10 years. So that's as a New so Yorker, I'm like, this is, yeah, this is illegal. So I'm fighting the correctional officers. I'm like, I need a fuck, Good for you. I need a law book. Like, this is not okay. So everyone around me in this, in this uh, jail was like, are you lost? Like, this is Arkansas. You're not getting any legal material. So that was probably Unreal. the first uh, moment where I'm like, I need to fight for prison reform. But I didn't know how, right? So I get my plea of five years, happily signed. So you ended up after a long thing. They don't want to go to trial. They said, there's an addict. Let's give her five years. After and you're in the county months. jail how long at this time? Six, six months. months. And are you showing? Are you like kind of red? I mean, I had jowls, Larry. Some days. Like I was so fat, <laughs> I had jowls. <laughs> well, you know, after being an addict, and you know this, Jessica, you probably the weight felt good in its own way. Oh yeah, for you know, sure. You know, you were, you know, you once you're sober, you you realize I look like shit. You don't think you do when you're you know an addict, and you got other addicts want you know, and all the shit that goes on out there. But now you. are feeling it i mean are you feeling the baby yeah um you know i, I was in denial for a few months probably three but after ah, a while i'm one. like yeah, i didn't know that i'm sure yeah there's stuff that goes on did you worry about losing the baby all the time every day every day because unlike the free world you can't just go to the doctor if you think something's wrong you know and right. i didn't have an ultrasound and i would beg the nurse please just check the heartbeat please just check, like something's wrong that's anxiety. So all the time I thought that I wasn't okay. There was even a situation where another girl tripped me because she didn't like me. She was actually sleeping with my baby daddy. So there's some tea there. Um, oh, yeah. She trips me and now I'm convinced. I get up to swing and my old biker chick friend that I, that I met in the county jail, she's like, are you insane? What are you doing? And I remember like, oh fuck, I'm pregnant. I can't fight her. I'm pregnant. Um, but I'm like, she hurt, she hurt my baby. She hurt my baby. So for a week, I begged the nurse, please listen to the heartbeat. Like this, this chick tripped me, something's wrong. And then I went into the nurse's like medical office and she checked the heartbeat. And when Micah's heartbeat came up, I just started bawling my eyes out because for a week I thought something was wrong. And that was at three months or maybe four. So I didn't really feel her moving, moving at all. Um, and wow. I was, I kind of went through a lot of situations like that, a lot. Um, I try to tell people in prison, there is no medical care. I love that. Oh, you're going to get medical. Oh, shit. You break your arm, they'll give you fucking aspirin. Uh, you're lucky if you'll see anybody, period. Uh, I mean, the medical care, even in the federal system, when I was in Arkansas, uh, the doctors don't even have to be licensed in that state because we were on a federal institution, which is the work. I used to love to hear people compare. I'd rather be in the state than the fed. Not when you're in maximum security prisons. I was in a prison, we had uh, 2,000 inmates, 800 had it life, mm. and never getting out. And it was murders and zoo. It was the worst prison in the country at the time. That was USP Atlanta. But getting back to your story, so here you are at six months pregnant, nine to go, still worried every day. You gotta worry about who's gonna like you, dislike you, you're gonna fight. You're, you're not heading to the state jail yet, right? You're not going to the, to, the, to the jail. You're still in jail, you're not going to prison yet, right? So USP Atlanta, just to back up a little bit, that's still a really messed up prison. I got a homie there right now. Oh, I know. Oh, it's bad. I know. It's bad. I, I hear from people all the time. I got a lot of contacts in there. It's a, I was in there for years, two years. And the holdover, I've been on Con Air 16 times. But that's another story. It is. Let's keep going to you. So, so you're, you're here, hon. Uh, you're uh, six months pregnant. You are just got sentenced. So you're not shipped off to the state jail yet, are you? So I, I was, I was shipped off pretty quickly after I signed my plea, uh, thank yeah. God. And I get up there and yeah. the nurses in intake, they didn't see that I was pregnant because I, I got this big old thing on, you know, they, they put us in different mm -hmm. clothing and I, I none of it fit. And I'm sitting there <laughs> of course. and I, she's asking me these questions, you know, and finally I just had to tell her like, do you know I'm pregnant? And she looked me dead in my face and said, well, how do you know you're pregnant? And I stood up. Cause I was just uh, sitting in this little chair. She was checking my blood pressure and I showed her my stomach and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> um, <laughs> gained 60 pounds in my uterus lady. Like yeah. I'm pregnant. <laughs> so you, the, the, yeah, had... it's the, the intelligent level of them people sometimes just off the charts. So ridiculous. Um, but she's like, Oh, well you're not staying here. You're going to Wrightsville. That's a medium. And I'm like, I'm going to a medium word. Like I was, I was excited about it. Right. So I stayed in max. Is it a medical unit? 50, 50. 
So uh, okay. they have a work release program out of there, and they also have like some cancer patients there, and the pregnant chicks get sent there. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different stuff going on there. Um, but I stayed in Max for a few weeks, and then they shipped me to Medium, and I had my baby. Um, and I, I actually got kicked out of the Medium and sent back to the Max shortly after I gave birth. Sounds like me. <laughs> You sound like me a lot because that's what happened to me after fighting mm -hmm. certain things. But the uh, so now you're at the prison and you have your baby at the prison. No. Um, so after she was born, I was actually in labor. And well, well, you're in the medium. You're in the medical unit, or whatever you want to call it, half of the medical unit, I assume. Yeah. Are there other pregnant ladies there? Yes, there are. Um, and this was my first experience with it. I had had experience with seeing girls, you know, test positive for pregnancy and they're pregnant in jail, but I never paid attention to it before because it didn't affect me, you know? And now I'm like, I'm the pregnant chick. Like this sucks, right? So at the time, I think in my dorm, we had five or six other pregnant women. So, um, and interestingly enough, I had seen women have their baby and come back in 24 hours and then get visitation with them. You can't keep the baby there. Um, and I thought, she did it. I could do it. It's not going to affect me that bad. If she's strong enough to handle it, I can certainly handle this. And you get, I mean, by their policy or whatever it is, you get 24 hours with the baby. 24 hours with the baby. Here you are, you're in prison, you're locked, uh, you know, just had the baby. You're shackled to the bed. The doctor gives you another 24 hours. That person has to be God, no? Yeah, I wish I remembered her name. I wish I could get a hold of her and just thank her for that because what was so small to anyone else was a huge deal to me. You know, I was that was the first time in that whole experience that I was actually treated like a human being. Um, you know, my, my visits, my doctor visits in the county jail, I was brought out to a free world free clinic and people were taking pictures of me in the free world pregnant, shackled up, going to the doctor. So if you have that picture of me, fuck you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I, I was so embarrassed and I was mortified that people were taking my picture, you know, but, but after my daughter was born, I, something was missing. I had her for nine months with me and now she's gone and I didn't know how to react to that. So I got to hold her for 48 hours. I wouldn't even let them take her to give her a little bath like you're supposed to do. You can say no, new mama. So did you did did you fight them uh, when you when they came to take the baby away? Yeah. Obviously, you can't have the baby. You're going back to prison now. They tell you, okay, you get discharged. Is it only 48 hours in the hospital? It's supposed to birth? only be 24 unless you have a C-section. But I had a, a normal birth. Or not, I don't want to say right. normal. They're both normal. I had a, you know. No, no, a, a regular vaginal yes. birth. A regular normal so, birth. They, uh, they take you and they, they, they kind of rip the baby out of your arms. I or had they, said, I mean, Do you have it up to the last minute? To, up to the last minute, I was holding her. And I knew that they were coming in the morning to get me. And I want to say it was about 10 a.m. And I placed Micah, that's my daughter's name, in this little bassinet next to the bed. And I'm holding on to it because I don't want to let go. And this is, this is the only person in the world I have ever loved, ever, um, besides a toxic boyfriend from my past. We don't got to mention him. <laughs> but this is mine. This is, I made this. This is my baby. And... I had never felt such an overwhelming sense of protecting my daughter, protecting anybody, you know? So I'm holding onto this bassinet and I whispered to her, I will be back for you. And I just wanted, I knew she couldn't understand me. She's a newborn, but I had to say it out loud. I will be back for you. I will be back for you. And now who's in the room? Is there guards, nurses? Who's in that there's room? There's one correctional officer and she was very mean, wouldn't even talk to me or let me get up to go to the bathroom because if she has to get up so I can go to the bathroom, she has to unchain my leg and that's just too much for her. That's how she acted. So I was not allowed to- so Would you use a bedpan? No, I held it for a while and then I'm like, I gotta go now. Uh. I, I tried to bother yeah. her the least amount possible because she was disgusted that I had to that she had to be at the hospital for her shift. You know, she was really shitty. They hate their own jobs, and and, and they project and that on justifiably uh, so. You know, there's very little humanity in prison. Yeah, and I understand hating that job, <laughs> justifiably so. It's not the greatest job in the world. Absolutely. But I'm a human. So they take your baby. So what happens? They take you. They put you in a wheelchair and wheel you back to the prison. Yeah. Or do they just I mean, you mustn't want to go, right? I, you don't want to. I don't want to go. I'll fight you because this is my baby. But I'm holding onto the bassinet, and I hear the keys. I hear the correction officers come to the door. 
because they are loud as hell. If you've never been to prison, you don't know, but the keys, like you just hear the keys jangling in the radio and like, they're just so loud. So I hear them at the door and I, they say to me, Kent, it's time to go. You better come in here and get me because I'm not trying to go. So I just, I think I remember telling them, no, I'm not even turned around. I'm not even going to look at you. I'm going to spend the last seconds that I have staring at this baby. She was so beautiful. She's still so beautiful, but I just couldn't even take my eyes off of her. And eventually they got sick of asking me. We're not asking anymore. So they came in and they grabbed me by my shoulders and slammed me down in this wheelchair. And I just gave birth. That was painful. And as quickly as they could, they put my leg in chains and they shackle me or handcuff my hands and they wheel me out of the hospital as fast as they could. Now I just left my newborn baby in this hospital room. I have no idea where she's going, who's gonna get her, what's gonna happen. They don't tell me anything and they throw me into the prison transport van. And I know I made their job harder because I told them no, but at the end of the day, like I was willing to do whatever it takes to stay there for any, like for a second longer. So now you're clean for, you're clean for nine months, obviously. Clean for nine months. I mean, my, just, just about nine months. I mean, you're three weeks in or whatever it was. My daughter's healthy. Um, and the doctor reassured me of that, which I'm so grateful that she did, but I was healthy. So the doctors kind of gave you the ass, the last end of the thing said, you know, you had a good doctor, gave you an extra 24 hours, obviously yeah. didn't have to do that. But you get that, you head back to prison. You're in a van, obviously, heading back to your prison. Uh, do they talk to you? Do they say anything? Or are they just typical assholes? Uh, they didn't even turn on the radio. <laughs> they just talked to themselves. <laughs> um, but I didn't ask. I usually ask, like, can you at least turn on the radio? But I didn't talk to them. I didn't care. They were talking about their lunch break or their their kid i don't even know some other shit not talking your mind about, is on your daughter yeah they're talking about some other and your shit. mind's on your daughter i mean just like thinking i gotta get back to my daughter i gotta get back to my daughter i gotta back my because i remember when i went away i had a 15 month old baby mm -hmm. and a six-year-old son and i and i i lost them for well over a decade it's gut-wrenching And i got out of prison my son was 18. oh my daughter was 13. so you uh headed back to the prison you go into intake in the prison and what happens? Do you go to medical? Do you, where do you go from there? Yeah. Um, I know where you go, <laughs> but um, I was in there enough, but uh, tell, tell the audience that. Yeah, I, I came back in through Sallyport, which is where they bring inmates, and there's this little change out room. They got to strip search you, and you got to do some really awkward and uncomfortable things to make sure you don't have contraband hidden. Oh, we say it, I say it. Spend and spread them. Squat and, and cough. <laughs> Yeah, so we got to do squat and cough. And I don't remember going through that. I don't remember them asking me that. But I barely remember them talking to me. I just remember not being able to talk. I couldn't really hear what they were saying. Um, I was traumatized. I had just looked like I was shell-shocked. I looked like I had been to war. Um, and they took me to the infirmary. And I stayed in the infirmary for two weeks. Psychologists came in. Um, Did you have postpartum depression? I had postpartum depression and PTSD. And... I, I saw other women do this, so why couldn't I do it? I didn't understand, you know? I had nine months to prepare. What is wrong with me? You know, no one ever told me about postpartum depression or PTSD. I didn't understand. I just knew I couldn't get out of that bed. And... Are you wondering what's going on with your kid every day? Every second. Like, all where I, is Mika? Where is Mika? All I could think of is, like, I just left that newborn two-day-old baby in a hospital. And that was the last time I saw her for six months. I didn't know where she was. How big was the baby when born? She was almost... Uh, give, give me the size and dimensions. Yeah, size and dimensions. Um, so she was six pounds, nine ounces, 15 inches or 16 inches long. She's Asian, so she's short. <laughs> ah, my my uh, my son was uh, six pounds, seven, uh, six pounds, 11 ounces, I think he's going to get mad at me. And uh, he was 20 inches. He was long. That's funny. Because yeah. we all know that. So here you got a healthy, healthy baby girl. Obviously, you'd go, you're in prison. Now you're in, po you're in the infirmary, in the prison, PTSD and postpartum depression is a real thing, everybody. It's real. And now you get out of the infirmary, you go back to the unit, you start work. What's your plan? So I just snapped out of it one day and I told myself, get up, get whatever it takes, get out of this bed, go back to your dorm, sign up for classes. You have to get your daughter. You can't lay in bed. Get the hell out of this bed. And I don't know what came over me that day, but I'm so grateful that I had that realization. And I'm so grateful that I was able to get up because for two weeks, I didn't think I could. For two weeks, I thought I'm broken. 
this person that was with me for nine months is gone. I don't even know where she is. And I was so damaged from that. I was so not mentally okay. So I get back to my dorm and I immediately go up to the cork board that they have where there's like different classes or schedules. And I'm just like, I need to sign up for everything. So I get kites and I sign up for thinking errors and I want to go to GED class and I want to, I want to do parenting and I want to go to NA. When is NA? And I'm asking people and they're like, yo, New York, where's your, where's the baby? Are you okay? Like you've been gone for two freaking weeks. I'm like, get out of my face, man. Unless you know the NA schedule, I'm not trying to talk to you. <laughs> and they, they, yeah. before like all the other women would come in and show the pictures of their baby and they'd have visits and they'd be talking about it. Everyone's in my face trying to ask me if I'm okay or where the baby is. And I'm like, does anyone know the GED schedule? <laughs> like I was just, I'm not trying to talk to you about that right now. I'm trying to, you know, get my stuff together. So I do, I sign up for- You wanted, you, you actually didn't want any, to do anything with anybody else except think about your future and your baby and everything. It kept you going. That's what kept you going. I mean, you can get trapped into that world we were trapped in and it, it's, it, we know the kind of world it is. It's, it's just a crazy world, but you started taking it and saying, I gotta get out, I gotta get my baby, I gotta do whatever I can do. All right, so you do your time, you're in a medium security prison. What happens, does anything happen to you? Well, get in trouble. I was supposed to eventually meet th with the parole board in this medium and parole out, right? It's supposed to be a very simple transition. Um, that didn't happen. So uh, shortly after I returned to my dorm, uh, I had a sex offender come up to me trying to help with paperwork. You know, I, I was studying the law before I gave birth because that was the first time that I was actually granted access to legal material. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, Arkansas state law. And she took notice of that. She knew that I was studying and I'm not trying to watch TV or go to the rec yard. I'm just trying to study and learn Arkansas state law because they gave me 40 years exposure and I had no idea what that meant. So I was just trying to understand my own shit. And she came up to me and everyone around her was like, oh, she's got a bad charge. But listen, man, I don't got time for your bad charge. I gotta get my daughter. I gotta focus on my own stuff. But she was very pushy with showing me her paperwork, which was the weirdest thing ever. Old, young? Was she old, she young? She was probably a few years older than me. So she was probably late okay. 20s. Says so young. Young, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, I'm getting old, but yes, young. <laughs> yes, young. And um, I told her, I saw the charges and I read over it probably in a minute or two. And I slid across the paperwork on this metal table they have in the day room. I slid it across the table and I said, you need to get away from me. And she's like, what? I'm like, you need to get away from me. <laughs> you know, because it was uh, bad. Uh, uh, a true chomo. True, I mean, I can't even ever repeat what I read in that paperwork. It's yeah, I see some sick shit, but they we used to fuck them up. But that's a long story. Yeah, and because uh, I know the law so well, I used to get the codes and see what the uh, law, and some of the shit. Said. It's horrifying. But go ahead. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So she took offense. So to go that. ahead. So you you have a fight. Yeah, she was really pissed off that I told her to get away from me, and she's bigger than me. She was towering over me. I'm sitting down. I'm not trying to even stand up. She's towering over me, and she's like Rah! like a chihuahua, and I just ignored her, and she eventually gave up. But then a couple hours later, she's trying to follow me all around. She's trying to, you know, she's really just in my head, just yelling at me, acting crazy. And what's crazy is you're the fucking Chomo. What are you talking about? She's talking about my case. Like I'm a drug dealer, dude. Get the fuck out of here. So I went to the bathroom and she pushed me and I thought, oh. In the, but just you two just in the bathroom? Two. So I hit her, hit her a few times and I end up on top of her. I'm punching her. Beat the go crazy in prison. Crazy. I even fucking crazy on people. Yeah. yeah um, so there's no such thing as a fair fight in prison. No. <laughs> no fair fight anywhere. But no one around me says 5 0 or gives me any indication that the cops are in the dorm. And I feel someone trying to pull at me. And I went like that and I went pop, And I hit the CO in the chest plate. And I, as soon as I did it, I was like, no, hello, darkness, you know my it. old you friend. Know <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's so funny how you just said cops. All convicts say, oh, the cops are coming. And it's guards in prison. Yeah. You know, we call guards cops. You know, people. I, I did a video on that, and people were going, what do you mean cops? I said, cops are guards in prison. You say, hey, the cops are coming, or whatever it is, right? Yeah, 5 you, it's not, man. Oh, you know, the, yeah, they're coming. But, okay, so now you go back. After that, you knew you were in trouble. You go to the shoe. They put you in admin. Then you go to a DHO. You have a hearing, and they say, you're guilty. They don't give a fuck who started it. It's a chomo. Yep. They don't think anything like that. So you go back to the max. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you go to a max, and when you're in the max, 
Do you still have your parole hearing up for that date? I mean, is there is, is anything pushed back or what? So because I still had plenty of time to the door, I didn't have my hearing yet. So it wasn't even scheduled yet. So. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you had one scheduled. Yep. I was just supposed okay, to. No, like, see. I was playing it out in my head. I was supposed to go to the parole hearing and get released gotcha. in a year. I'm just going to skate by with okay. the medium. Like, no. Not me. Not Jessica. So, go to the max. Do my time in the hole. <laughs> and then, um, I actually got released um, and went back to the general population unit. And that is where they put me. On chain gang. So, I could talk to you guys forever about my experience there. Um, you mean to tell me you... they. They put you on a chain where you go outside the prison? Ain't shit ain't happening where we were at, man. They would never let those dudes in Atlanta or all of us out of prison. Are you fucking No, I mean, me? I, I was... Zoo. You're outside of the gate. You're outside of the fence, like right outside the prison, and you're lined up with a hoe, and you're just hoeing the ground for hours. My hands were all cut up and bleeding, and they played Break the Yankee with me. I don't even know how many times. At this time, Jess, what? how much time did you have left? And you know you calculate. Yeah. Inmates are like... You know, convicts, I'd say, okay, at the beginning, it was like, I got so much, I got 12 years to the door. Are you fucking kidding me? But, you know, when you get closer and closer, you're thinking, oh, another year, fuck, that's nothing. Yeah. How much time at this point did you have? After my seg time and all of that, I had like a year. So it was a year and a half when I left the medium and then a year left. I got to get my class back because oh, wow. they demote you. And I had to, you know, earn my class. So they put me out of class four chain gang and the bad bad kid now at this dorm. time are you at all talking to your daughter or how are you getting updates or anything about your daughter or are you it's a good question um for four months i didn't even see a picture of her but at four months i got a picture and the from, who? from the foster family okay really good people i actually still talk to them and i thought oh my god that's a completely different baby <laughs> i left a two-day-old baby and now this baby is huge she's four months and so cute um and then at six months i finally Thank had god, a people. Oh, they're yeah. great people um at six months i had a court hearing for her and the judge granted me a 15-minute visit in chambers it is as short well, you, as it you sounds. You're in, you're in prison and you had a court hearing. In prison, I had a court hearing at six months to determine, like, where are you? What's the plan? Um, obviously, I'm in orange because they had to transport me back to the county jail. I had to sit in county jail for a few days sure. and then go to court. It's a whole process. Um, so, obviously, I'm still in jail. Boy, do I know it. I know. It's, uh, it's so rough. But they extended it. They're like, we'll come back um, a month after your release date. I didn't know what to expect, but I held my daughter for the first time when she was six months old. And it just, it... Now, is that at the courthouse? I mean, is that the courthouse? It's in chambers, yep, at the courthouse. And I was so oh grateful for God. that. And that literally, like, set in stone my mission, you know? Because time and space away from the situation, you start to maybe forget what your mission is. My mission is get yeah. this baby. Ironically, the foster father was a police officer. I didn't know that. He was not in a uniform when I met him in, in court, but the way he was standing, you guys, convicts know a cop when they see one. Um, I can tell. So he, he had his <laughs> arms crossed. He wasn't anywhere near me. He wasn't going to talk to me. By his body language alone, I'm like, that's a police officer. Um, and he was. So I'm like, it's this weird vibe, this con versus cop vibe in chambers, and it's a little awkward. But I told the foster mom, I'm not like anyone else you've ever met. I'm different. I'm going to get my daughter back. Please just take care of her and love her with everything you have until I get back. I'll be back. Um, her husband didn't believe me at first, of course. Why would you? I never gave of you a course. reason to believe anything I'm saying. Um, but after I got out, they became my biggest advocates. You know, they saw that the determination alone that I have, that is in every fiber of my being. It's in everything I do. I wake up early. I work my ass off. I, I make sure that at the end of the day, I've given that day 100% because I have to get my daughter. That's all I care about in the world. Because that's the kind of cops that we need, and that's the kind Ugh. of people we need to be cops. Uh, caring, believe in second chances, uh, are cautious. But They're so good. Uh, so now you take, you're out, you get to the door, you're excited, you go into a halfway house, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you get to a halfway house, you start work, what do you do? I, um, yeah, at the halfway house, they were actually charging me rent, that's a whole different situation, but... Oh, that's a whole other thing, yeah, uh, I don't know about that. I didn't have sneakers when I left prison. I didn't have clothes, I didn't have sneakers, I had a driver's license. New York will give you an ID at least. Arkansas is like, get out, we don't care. 
Um, yeah. So I had 25 hours. <laughs> here you go. I had prison shower shoes and a hoodie that I borrowed from somebody, and I got a telemarketing job that day. So <laughs> I told you I got a, a telemarketing job when I first got out in a halfway house in Tampa. Funny man, <laughs> selling Verizon contracts. Check that out, convicts. Unbelievable what they do. But go ahead. It's awesome. So uh, you get out, you're working. Mm -hmm. I'm working. And I am uh, working at a telemarketing job from sun up to sundown. And then in between, I'm court mandated to go to NA meetings. I felt like it was a waste of my time personally because I got money I have to make. You're taking me out of work mm -hmm. to go here. And I just, I needed to work. Um, I also had to go to prison. NA is good for some people. It's, it's not for others. I often say that. Uh, Every one of them are different, in my opinion. It's the person. Uh, but whatever it takes to help somebody, that's good, too. So now you're out. Your time to... Do you get to see a baby right away? Nope. Nope. Um, I actually didn't know if I was going to... Oh, that's got to rip you apart. I mean, you're out. You're free. You're, 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 you know, you're getting free air, but you can't go see your baby. So it was not made easy for me at all. So I, um, I contacted DHS... Department of Human Services the day I got out and asked and they said well your court date is on this date come there and we'll talk about your case plan that was like a month maybe two months away so I was frustrated already um, but they did make sure that I got hair follicle drug tested so that was a hoot um, and they placed my daughter four hours from where I paroled out to and you have to go for visitation after they grant you that so I went to my court hearing they granted me two hour visitation so I can go to Searcy, Arkansas from spring. So you have to travel four hours to go for two and then back for four. Yes, every week for... How would you, how do you do that? How do you do that? By bus or by... Uh, you, do you have a vehicle? I have nothing. I had to hustle and ask for rides. I'm a New Yorker. I'll get it done. It's all right. Um, so I asked different people I worked with, friends, family, friends of people at the halfway house. I need a ride. You know, I'll pay you when I pay you. I didn't. I barely had gas money. You know, and people. You know, it's funny saying. It's funny saying with New Yorkers. Uh, I could drop you off naked in Alaska, and, and you'll show up a week later in Boston with a with a three piece suit and thousand dollars. <laughs> I mean, that's just certain people are like that. They, they find a way is what that means. Yeah. You know, I, but I'll go ahead. Now you got the money. I'll find a way. You, you, you hustle it. You figure it out. You figure it out. Yeah. My first paycheck from the uh, telemarketing job was like $60. Um, so I was struggling, but I'm going to ask someone, if you tell me, no, you're busy, you can't do it. I'll ask somebody else. And I just found a way. I never missed one visit and I figured it out every step of the way. I mean, that's not like around the corner, Jess. That's four hours each way. Yeah. I mean, some of the guys in halfway houses, you know this, they don't have a car that can go four hours. I mean, you know, it's just the way they are. Nobody had money. You know, we all struggled. I mean, I remember taking the buses and every time I got my dad's old car, an old blue Skylock, 1994 Skylock. And this is in 2007. But anyway, go ahead. And uh, so now here you are. You're going back and forth. You're seeing your child, uh, and, you, and is the is the force the family seeing how you're connecting with this baby? Um, they do, and over time, I originally had two hour visits that got increased to four hours, and then six hours. But now I have two jobs. I'm trying to dance around these schedules, and didn't have a car yet, so I had to ask a friend to either loan me the car or drive with me. And I was very fortunate to find some decent people that that really helped me during that time. And, um, yeah, cool, you know, the judge granted me overnight visits and this was amazing, but complicated because I have two jobs. Um, so I had to drive four hours, drive home four hours. That, that girl is tired. She's a toddler. You know, she just wants to play. She doesn't want to be in the car. Um, but a road wow. trip warrior was born that day because she is just so well behaved and so awesome. And we made it as fun as we could for her. And you know, I, I would take her. When you home. say we, we wait, wait. You say we. No, oh, me. Who's we? <laughs> oh no, I didn't. I didn't know if you had. Because uh, now you're out. You get all. You you get all out of the halfway house. You're starting to get. When do you meet your husband? I met Reese. Um, we're not, we're not married, but I met him. Well, when do you meet your love of your life? Is, can I say that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Sure. <laughs> When do you meet the man that you're with now that, that is the father of your son? Uh, you October. Uh, the, I got out in like April uh, of 2013, and he, I met him in October of 2013. So it was before I had custody, 
So they were getting to know each other, but I had to keep that on the DL because you're not supposed to date while you have a DHS case and you're in recovery and no one wants you to date then. Oh. And like, I just, uh, and yeah, I wasn't, try to put all this shit over I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure that this is the guy. And I was really nervous to even introduce my daughter to him because what if you're great now and you leave? So I was very, very nervous. Yeah. Um, we actually dated an entire year before I even let him move in. He was living with his grandmother and he was in drug court. How, how did you get a place? I mean, did you just save up enough money to get an apartment and do everything on your, yeah, on um, your own from working 20 hours? I bet you were working sometimes 16 hour shifts. I know how it works. Yep, I'd go to the telemarketing. You want to work. You want to get out of the halfway house. Yep. Yeah. I stopped paying rent at the halfway house because I couldn't afford it. And I'm like, if they kick me out, I'll figure it out. Simultaneously, I'm putting in applications for apartments and getting denied because I'm a felon. Um, and I had a court date. I know this is kind of all over the place, but I had a court date and the judge was like, you have until this date to get an apartment. And time was running out. I found a guy and I was very honest. And I'm like, listen, if you don't rent me this apartment, I'm not going to get my daughter. I'm in this kitchen of this crappy duplex crying to this guy. I'm like, I need this place. You don't understand, bro. And I just freak out. I'm like, I have the money. Just please take the fucking money. I was so frustrated because um, I'm a felon. I was denied in Arkansas time and time I again. I know that is. And uh, they're like, you're going to have a meth lab here. I don't think so. I'm like, oh, I swear to God, I'm not. <laughs> so so he, he took pity on me. He believes in you. Yep. He, he heard a little bit about my story and he took pity on me. And I signed the lease that day and I moved in the next day. Really crappy place. And the day I was moving in, I looked around and I'm like, there's no refrigerator. I thought there would be one. Like, how is there no refrigerator? <laughs> oh, my God. No washer dryer. So here you are, a place with no furniture, no... So you start like everybody else to get a bed just to sleep in, to get a uh, a table to eat on, to get a couch yeah. to, I mean, literally piece by piece, correct? Mm -hmm. I had a couple pieces donated wow. to me, um, an old mattress that was just on the floor. I had that for a while. Yeah. Um, that didn't matter. Yeah. And then my daughter's pieces of her furniture and some clothes that was also donated to me by friends that I worked with. They're like, oh, my daughter has outgrown all this stuff. You can have all, this, all these clothes. Her toddler bed, I'm not even And you know, it. you thought it was Christmas when you got that. I was... When you got stuff from people, you know, I, I, I tell people now, you know, I, I look at people and I live a crazy life from multi-millions to zero, <laughs> eating ramen noodle soups, so staying hungry. And, you know, eating them raw and then drinking water to fill your stomach up. But I, I tell people, I could live, I have a 30-foot RV. I love going out. I could care. It's, it was better than my prison cell. I, I, I might do stuff out of my garage. People don't get it. They don't get what an ex-felon can do because we lived in a fucking cell that was the shittiest shit, a fucking toilet and a frisk sink together and a smelly-ass fucking roommate sometimes mm -hmm. or whatever the hell it is. And here you are, you know, you got your own place and you don't give a shit. And people think, oh, this shit, I used to think it's a fucking castle. You know, and it's going from a millionaire to nothing, back to struggling, and you don't give a shit. But, so now you're out, you're doing good, the judge awards you the baby? So after I a mean, year. what day, after a year of doing the visits, doing the stuff, the family's really nice, you said. And I think you should interview them. If you don't want, I will. <laughs> uh, and uh, they... The judge says to you one day, okay, you can have your daughter back. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to, I, I'm get, look, I got fucking goosebumps. I'm going to make a and tough I'm guy like thinking, you cry. <laughs> oh, fuck, I don't give a shit. I, I used to tell people, we did some shit, man. I fucked some people up. But we were all a bunch of murderers in a room one time. <laughs> fucking got there crying over something. Nobody said a mm -hmm. word. <laughs> you kidding me? So anyway, here you are, Jess. You get the baby. The judge orders, you got it back. What was that like? Did you go grab the baby? Did you run? Did the people help you? Did they give you stuff? Yeah, I mean, they, they still, I'm sure they, I hope they still hear from you and, and they look at the baby. Daily. And, and say, wow. Yeah. You know. um, so, yeah, so she was, just to back up a little bit, the judge granted me um, temporary custody. So for a few weeks, she was living with me and I was working. And they gave me vouchers for daycare for her. And that was amazing but i had no clue what i was doing so it was amazing but i'm like what's up kid you want some spaghetti like i don't know how to cook anything i don't know how to take care of of a kid so i kind of learned you learn as you go you know and i was very tired i mean i was working full time and she's in daycare and i'm running back and forth from everything but um i was grateful because i have her like she's in my possession like you said before um 
So I had my final court hearing and you have no idea what the judge is going to say. You know, I don't have the nicest stuff, but I got some stuff and I have a, a Scion XB box car now. Um, this isn't like New York. There's no public transit, really. There's a local bus, but it's not really, it's not great. Um, yeah, the, it comes every hour, two hours. The car had no air conditioning in the South. Like it was not pleasant, but um, I go to court with her and... I remember walking her in, just holding her little hand. She's walking super slow because she got little tiny legs. And I'm just like, let's just get there. Come on, girl. So I scooped her up and I carried her in just so we could get in front of the judge faster because I can't even wait anymore. Like, I just need to know the decision because I didn't sleep the night before. I was so scared. I can't come this far to only go this far. I have to have full custody. This has to be over. And I finally walk in. I set Micah down by me. And I'm just standing there. I'm shaking. I've never, I've gone to prison. I'm not ever afraid. I am terrified of this judge, you know, and I've never been afraid of a judge before in my life. And, you know, I'm standing in front of her and it, <laughs> she is looking over all this stuff, my lease, the bill of sale for my car, my NA sign sheet, because I still have to go to those. And she's looking over all this paperwork. It takes And you're scared of this judge right now. I mean, like this judge has your life in her hands. I mean, your child's life in her hands. Yeah, this is what's going to... Her word goes. This is what's going to determine everything. You know, I would not be okay if I lost her a second time. I wouldn't be sitting I, here with you. You'd probably be back to being an addict. I, I really believe that. I would have died. I wouldn't be here with you right now. Um, but the judge finally, after an eternity, looks up at me and says, Miss Kent, um, I'm really impressed. You've done a lot in a year. I've never seen somebody work like this. I've never seen somebody work so hard. And I am very proud to say that unless there's any um, objections from caseworkers, I'm willing to grant you sole legal custody of Micah. And I thought, are you serious? Like, I can leave? Can I have her? Can I just leave? And, um, you know, she smiles at me for the first time. I had never seen this judge smile before. <laughs> she was very serious. And, you know, the, the caseworker says no objections. And the judge looks up at me and she goes, good luck to you. And I grab oh. my daughter and I run out and I don't even care did who's you watching. Hug her? So did you squeeze her? Like, I, you know, when I get, I want to squeeze. I'm so big. Sometimes I worry about crushing something. But yeah. it's like, ugh. I, oh, right God. outside of the courthouse, I'm on my knees, hugging my daughter, crying, so happy. And I said, we did it, girl, we did it. And she has no idea what that means, but we did it. Yeah. And, and, and how old is she at this time, three? Oh, a little over two. Little over two, yeah. wow. Ugh. So she she will never remember the other times. I mean, obviously we all don't. But, but just now, to add, I share that, she knows. She knows our story, she knows she was born in prison. I have a very open dialogue about addiction and jail and the mistakes that I made and how I took responsibility for my mistakes. You know, I think good. that's important. Absolutely, good for you. So now here you are, let's bring you to today. Uh, Micah, and we're gonna show a picture here, is eight? She's eight and she's eight going on 28. That child is so grown. Yeah, you're gonna <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I got 31 year old kid. My son, who you know, he's your mm -hmm. age, actually. Uh, my son talked to you to set this up. He's 31. He'll be 31 in November. Born in 89. Me too. <laughs> and Yeah, and uh, my daughter's born in 95. But anyway, so now, here you are today. Obviously, you're, you're working hard. You're giving your story out. You're on YouTube. Uh, and you're, you're living in Illinois? I live in Did Chicago, in the Chicago suburbs. Chicago. Um, okay. I have graduated with my bachelor's degree. I have a YouTube channel. I'm writing an autobiography. Good for you. Congratulations, kid. Yes, I'm going to send you my book as well. Uh, Please. Gangster Redemption. I will send you a copy, a signed copy. Just send me your address. Uh, and it does very well. It's a crazy story in my whole life. And you'll get that drift. But, you know, write the book, Jess. Please write the book. Uh, people will want to read about it. You got a story of toughness. You know, listen, you were a bad person and you admit it, but you made bad choices. You were never a bad person. It's in you, mm -hmm. the goodness is in you. It just, we, we, we cloud it with bad choices. All, all oh, I was a shitty human and, being. <laughs> There's no uh, yeah, and glossing that, over yeah, that. I don't, I don't buy that ever. I won't buy that. I'll buy that you were a person who did shitty things. A uh, person that didn't give a fuck about others. You didn't, it was all about getting high. We all know about addictions. But you were never, you know, obviously showed it. The minute you were off drugs or the minute you even had a kid or knew you had a kid, you got off them on your own. It's not like they fucking strapped you down in a room and fucking, you know, gave you shit and they put you in these shit that you read about. 
No, you did it because in here you knew, I got a fucking baby. That baby's in me. I can't fuck that baby. Your baby wasn't born addicted. And I feel, trust me, even if they are, I still think people change. They didn't know it. Addiction's a crazy shit, but mm -hmm. I wanted to just, you know, say that it, your story is amazing. Obviously, we did this is the longest interview I did. Actually, I did one with Paulie. Uh, we're doing more. Uh, but he did 28 years. He's a very close friend of mine. And uh, anyway, your story is amazing. I, I want to just say, even before ending, I'm, I'm proud of you. I hate that. I don't like ever to say that and sound condescending because I never will because I, I treat, whether it's a 13-year-old kid or an 80-year-old person, I treat them with respect because I want respect back. That's how I live my life, period, and all the shit I did in my life. But I got to say this. I'm so proud of you. I'm so... I have such respect for you. One, sticking to you, who you are. You didn't rat. You didn't do anything like that. Even though, forget all about that. It's... You did something for another person, which is a human being, and it's going to go well beyond what you've done for your daughter. Because other people are going to hear this story and have maybe a mom who was an addict or a dad or a, or maybe they're in that, that realm what you are in right now. And people are going to hear it, you know, and they're going to say, wow, I can do it too. And your, your, your story is a story of fucking great hope, redemption, uh, success. It is success, and you went the rough route. You're not, you're, you're not making excuses for that rough route. Oh, I had a bad life. I don't ever do that either. Never. And I just want to say that. Uh, any, any last words you want to say to the audience? Just thank you so much for watching this long ass interview. See if you made it to the end. And Larry, thank you for having me. And um, you know. At the end of the day, you are stronger than you know. And if I did all that stuff, if I overcame that, there's no reason why you can't. Just push forward and do everything you can to try to right some wrongs. You know, I, I was a crappy person back in the day. I would never say that I wasn't or, or try to make excuses. Um, but it's what I'm doing today that kind of um, helps me with all the junk I did in the past. I'm trying to balance out those kar karmic scales a little bit. But again, um, thank you so much for having me and I can't wait to interview for my channel. It's gonna be an awesome one. All right, thank you very much again, Jessica. Good luck, keep us posted. Uh, anything coming out, please, we'll, we'll, we'd love to help you or uh, try to help you point your book, whatever you're gonna do, because your story need, needs to be told. Thank you. All right, everybody. This has been a great, great interview, one of the best. Uh, please, if you want to check her out, she has her own YouTube channel. Just go to Jessica Kent. Uh, you know how to get it. It'll be a link in our description as well to where, right to get where it is. And uh, we're going to have a great time uh, uh, staying in touch with her. Check her out. Have a great day, everybody. Remember, make good choices. The, today is the day you can make one good choice. And make one good choice every day. And you're going you're gonna to help somebody along the way. Have a great day, everybody. See you soon.